Good afternoon, my friends. This is Paul, and today I'm going to be reviewing to you Paper Mario the Origami King for the Nintendo Switch, the game that some people just would not pick up because they were so let down by Paper Mario games in the past, whereas others have been cautiously optimistic because the whole theme of brainwashing the paper citizens to become origami is very, well, it's kind of a mature theme for the Paper Mario series, and this kind of stuff hasn't really been dabbled with since 2007 Super Paper Mario, taking a much more mature type of storyline. And I'm pleased to say that while the character variety certainly has something to be desired, Shigeru Miyamoto, I swear if I wasn't a Christian, I'd probably do something terrible to you, I would say that in pretty much every other regard, this may actually be better than Thousand Year Door in almost every department, as it really lived up to the hype, learned from the mistakes of the other games, and within the strict limitations that certain people within Nintendo put on them, I think Intelligent Systems did the best that they could to deliver a compelling Mario adventure that felt like it was both a continuation of good ideas from the past, while also not being afraid to take a few risks. So for starters, field exploration is hugely improved over its predecessors, because unlike Super Paper Mario and Beyond, the worlds aren't segmented by either a world map or a chapter select like Super Paper Mario, and you also don't go level to level Super Mario Bros. 3 style. This time, everything is interconnected, and the only real times you use warp pipes to conveniently skip to another world is either if you're actually going underground or if you've already been there and you need a fast travel system. And this is really effective because it gives the world a feeling of connectedness that the other Paper Mario games just couldn't deliver. You sort of felt like, you know, Shiver City was so disconnected from the rest of the world because you just casually took a warp pipe to get there instead of, I don't know, journeying toward Shiver City. And the environments themselves are really huge and beautiful. Even if you've seen the same cliché themes over and over again, the way that one, they're woven into beautifully crafted paper, two, the lighting is amazing, and three, they're about as fun to explore as a kingdom in Super Mario Odyssey if Super Mario Odyssey wasn't a platformer. There's a lot of hidden collectibles and goodies to find, and the game gives you a good incentive to go out of your way to try to collect everything. The more toads you collect, the more they'll help you out in battle if you get stuck on the sometimes overwhelmingly difficult puzzles. And some toads, if you rescue them, will give you additional functions in the towns that will help you even more. If you rescue the shopkeeper, for example, you'll be able to buy weapons. If you rescue the guy that lives at the mansion, well, I won't spoil the reward, but it's pretty darn awesome. So overall, you feel incentivized to rescue the toads. When you see giant holes in the ground and you fill them up with the confetti that Mario can get from basically hitting everything in sight with his hammer, then that fills up the in-game soundtrack. Finally, Mario! And if you collect all the trophies, then you can basically take a good look at models of things in your game if you were disappointed that Super Smash Bros. Ultimate didn't have trophies. And overall, the benefits of collecting, in addition to the fact that when you go to the map screen, you have percentage meters to show how much you're missing of a certain collectible, makes it so that completionists should have a relatively easy time, most of the time, with filling out those statistics. And I would say that most of the rewards are pretty worth it. Sometimes there are definitely tedious moments, like that toad in the golf holes on Picnic Road. I don't think I'm ever going to forget that. But overall, I would say that the satisfaction you get from completing the tasks outweighs the tedium of sometimes getting to that. But most of the time, you're not going to encounter experiences as frustrating as what I described. I feel like the toads are treated a lot like the Korok seeds in Breath of the Wild, or they're kind of just everywhere. And I feel like a lot of players are going to discover them without even trying to. In fact, some are even mandatory for the story to progress. So in a matter of speaking, you're sort of completing the side quest by, by completing the main story to begin with. Now let's talk about the battle system a little bit. Now there's actually three different types of battles, which is super cool because it doesn't fall into the uh, not another battle 
trend that plagued every other Paper Mario game to date. Whether you like the battle system or not, that's up to you. But you have to admit that it's cool that Super Paper Mario tried to contextualize how big the enemy was and where you were fighting. So there's the standard ring battles, which basically have Mario in the center of the arena, and the enemies are all along the sides and middle, and you have to arrange the rings in such a way that the enemies are lined up so that Mario can either jump across them with his boots, or arrange them in a square so that Mario can hit them with his hammer blast. At first, these battles are really cool, and I would dare say this is probably the most engaging battle mechanic I've ever seen in an RPG, because you actually feel like the enemies are legit surrounding you and they're going to assault you if you don't do things exactly right. On the other hand, you only have so many moves that you can move the rings, and there's also a timer that you can't get rid of. What is with Mario games and timers? When are they ever going to learn that we don't like being timed? Well, there are ways that you can offset this, like getting accessories that give you more time to arrange the rings, or you can literally buy time by spending coins to increase the timer. I wish there was an option where you could just turn it off altogether and take your time battling the enemies. Maybe they wanted it, be, it to be more realistic, because in a real battle you can't stop and think about what your opponent is going to do, but then again, how can you be expecting realism in a game where everything's made out of paper? Surely they can allow some creative liberties. Not only that, but some of the puzzles get so hard that I don't know of too many players that are going to be able to solve them with the limited moves and time available to them. So it's good that you're allowed to pay the toads that you rescued to make the puzzles so that they basically become a cakewalk. But on the other hand, if you don't solve the puzzles, then you don't get as much of a payoff in the attack department. Then again, some of the enemies are easy enough to deal with even without an attack up, so I feel like that's a moot point. But overall, the battle system in itself is engaging. If they got rid of the timer, I think I would like it a heck of a lot better. Next up, there's the Paper Macho Bad Guys, which take place in real time, which is perhaps a callback to Super Paper Mario's real-time battle system. And you have to hammer them at the right time and the right place while dodging in the environment for when they're going to attack you. These were some of my favorite battles because even though they were really short, they tested my environmental awareness and my reflexes more than the ring battles did. Finally, my favorite variety are the boss battles, where instead the boss is in the center of the arena and Mario has to make his way to the bosses by creating a series of arrows and on switches. This is a bit frustrating at first because you have to have an arrow in front of Mario for him to even take a step forward, and then you have to land on a specific space for him to take action, so if you forget to do that then you might not be able to use a healing item. But overall, the boss battles, I feel like they're a good mixture between too easy and too hard. On one hand, sometimes they can be pretty tough to figure out exactly the right pattern to get to them. But on the other hand, if you pay the toads to help you, they don't give away the solution like they do in the regular battles. They just tell you what path you're currently taking to get to the boss, and you can make slight adjustments. They can also give you some healing items, which is really helpful if you don't know how to line it up on an action icon, because in regular battles you can heal pretty much any time, so why not in boss battles? These are some of the most memorable battles I have ever encountered in a Mario game. And even though the bosses may be just generic paper type items, I still really liked the way their dialogue was handled and the way the battles took advantage of their shape and personality to create a memorable encounter. I'm also really thankful that you can replay a lot of the battles and heck, a lot of the content if you go to the museum. There's trophies to collect, you can actually listen to the in-game soundtrack, about time Nintendo, and you can replay a lot of the boss battles. This is super cool because one thing I've always hated about the Paper Mario games is that they've kind of felt like one and done deals. Like, after you get through a certain area, the only way you can re-experience the magic is either to watch a YouTube video or to start a whole new file and get that far again. I'm glad that, while you can't exactly replay all of the events, you can replay a lot of the finer 
battle and musical moments, which that is really appreciated. And honestly, I wish more games would take the hint and give us this kind of stuff. Professor Layton versus Phoenix, right? Anyone? Now, there are definitely problems with this game. As much as I've been praising it, there are certainly some things that I think Nintendo could afford to loosen up a little bit. For instance, the character models are ridiculously annoying. On paper... Oh dear, am I going to start making paper puns again? It's pretty cool that they're separated into origami and paper variations, which allows for some pretty clever interactions. On the other hand, the same Toad models are reused so many times that at the beginning of the game, when you're asked if you want to shatter Toads into oblivion, I think some people are actually going to say, yes, we're tired of seeing them. Just give characters like maybe Petey Piranha or Vivian, you know, characters with actual personality and lore. That being said, Olivia, Mario's constant companion, is a very well-written character, and I almost never got tired of hearing her one-liners. In fact, I tried really hard to balance out this footage so that you guys could hear as many of her funny lines as possible in the early stages of the game. Overall, she's a charming companion, and maybe it's just that she's very compatible with my personality type, but I really liked having Olivia along, and I would dare say I actually prefer the system to the partners in Paper Mario 1 and 2. Now, don't get me wrong, I liked the partners and how they provided abilities in both the overworld and the battle, but in terms of dialogue, they exhausted most of their good speech after you first met them. Whereas Olivia is relevant throughout the entire plot, and you actually do get some partners that do assist you in battle, albeit it works a little bit differently than how Paper Mario 2 does, and because the partners are situation-based, based on where you are in the storyline, it means that they're able to converse with Olivia and are able to stay relevant in the current plot because they're part of it. So therefore, it's kind of like what I really liked about Three Houses, where a lot of the dialogue changed depending on where you were in the story, and this sometimes even affected the support conversations. So in other words, no one ever outweighs their welcomes, and you never feel like, oh, I should never use this person because they stink in battle. And overall, I just think that if only intelligent systems would show as much care with the writing of the characters as they would with the designs and names, I think this has the potential to, if Paper Mario decides to go forward and doesn't decide to just do the remaster Thousand Year Door treatment, this is a really good direction to take the series in. There are definitely some obtuse puzzles here and there that are definitely going to bog down the experience, and the battle system's timer really got on my nerves. But overall, I had a blast with Origami King. There were several intense and sometimes even epic moments. The story actually got pretty dark and intense at times. And while it's not going to be a groundbreaking narrative, the scenarios that unfold during the narrative more than made up for it, and I never got bored of playing the game. I was always excited to see what new thing the creators would come up with next. And I was also really excited to see that intelligent systems learn from their mistakes of Sticker Star and Color Splash and actually manage to give Bowser a personality, among a couple of other little things. So since this game came out in 2020, thankfully, I am going to give it probably, I'd like to say a 15 or 16 out of 20. It's not perfect. There are definitely some things that I could see improved on, but it's a huge step up from the disappointments the fan base have felt in the past. While that may be an unpopular opinion, as there are some people that are just going to insist that it's like the first two games or Super Paper Mario, but I think that this is a solid endeavor well worth playing. And I definitely think that while you may want to wait for it to go on sale if you're on the fence about this new style, I definitely think you're going to have a blast with the writing and the music and the graphics and the wonderful exploration. With that, thank you very much for watching, and until the next time, keep the faith, stay epic, God bless, and if you know how to do origami, that would be pretty cool if you could show me an example, because that seems like a pretty cool craft. Bye!